We want to welcome all of you, those of you that are at home joining us through the internet, as well as those of you that are here in person. All are welcome at Asbury. My name is Doug Covert, and I will be your liturgist this morning. We do have a couple of announcements. Holy Week begins today. We will have services on Thursday and Friday evenings to commemorate Christ's final days on earth. Please join us as we remember what God has done for us through Christ. Then celebrate the resurrection with us next Sunday. We will have a sunrise service at the Glenwood lot at 7 a.m. Our regular services at 9 and 11 here in this building. Please invite your family and friends to join us either in person or online, and we can't wait to celebrate with you. Don't forget the Easter egg hunt, 10 a.m. this coming Saturday morning. Invite all the kids you know and have some Easter fun. See our website, the Facebook page, or Wanda Fultz if you need more information. Our second Sunday offering this month is for Camp Pocomath. Please be generous in helping our youth attend through our scholarships that can potentially change a life for Christ. The flowers on the altar this morning are in memory of Terry Lyons. Please continue to keep the family in prayer during this difficult time. And now if you would please stand as you're able and join me in the call to worship. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, rejoice for the Lord is in our midst. He comes with joy and hope to set us free. Here. Hosanna, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest heaven. Amen. And now as you are able, please remain standing and we'll sing hymn number 278, Hosanna, loud Hosanna.
And now again, please remain standing and join me as we pray together the opening prayer. With great joy, we welcome you, Lord Jesus. The journey has been long, and we have longed to enter the holy city. Come to your hearts and our church, home to be patiently encouraging us to learn and grow, to embark on journeys of hope and healing. Open our hearts today to hear your words as we sing praise to you, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the Lord's name. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture this morning is from Psalm 118. I'll be starting at verses 1 and 2 and then jumping to verse 19 through 29. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. A little louder. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> it's so good to be in the house on Palm Sunday, the beginning of our Holy Week. This is a time for us to rejoice, but also to reflect. So please, please do join us for Thursday night service and Friday night service as we really remember what brings us from this Sunday to next Sunday and gives us the joy of resurrection and eternal life. So let us go to the Lord in prayer to ask a blessing on the gifts that we have received. Holy God, we thank you for the gift most and foremost of Jesus, the gift that he is to each and every one of us, Lord, and continues to be our salvation, our life. So Lord, we know that as we come with hearts of gratitude that we are giving back to you just a part of the many blessings you have given us. And Lord, we ask that these gifts that we receive go out into the world to spread the joy of your salvation, to share the news, the good news of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Lord, help the gifts that we receive change our hearts in the giving and change the heart of others in the receiving. And this we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand for the doxology.
may be seated. <clears throat> Holy God, we come to you this morning with burdens on our hearts. Lord, we know that you love us so deeply and that you are concerned for the things that we are concerned about. Help us to be concerned for the things that you are concerned about as well. Lord, we lift up all of those that in the past week have been hit by tornadoes and have lost their homes and their livelihoods and, Lord, are starting to rebuild. Lord, we, we know how awful it could be to lose our home in the blink of an eye. We also lift up those that lost loved ones in those same storms, and we rejoice in those that were saved. Lord, we lift up our continuing concern for the war in Ukraine, for the atrocities that were committed not too long ago, Lord. Please change the hearts of those who can look another fellow human being in the eye and still commit such horrendous acts. Lord, change their hearts. Help them see every human being as worth worthy of good treatment and never worthy of such horrendous deeds. Lord, we ask that all of us have hearts of compassion and concern for those around us. Lord, help us to be the light in the darkness, reaching out to those in need for whatever need that there may be, whether it's here in our homes or our communities, or around the world. Lord, we lift up those to you that are dealing with issues in their personal lives that are, can be overwhelming. Maybe it's depression and anxiety. Maybe it's a financial need. Maybe it's a loss of housing. Maybe it's not being able to put food on the table, Lord. Lord, we ask for you to provide in such a mighty way to heal those that need healing and to comfort those who have suffered loss. But, Lord, to restore the joy of your salvation to all. Lord, we just celebrate what you have done for us, especially what you have done for us in Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Um, this morning, I can't think of a more apt special music than the Palms, which I know is a very, we sing this, you know, a lot and for Palm Sunday, but it's such a beautiful song. And this year, uh, I'm not asking you to sing if you don't want to, but I have put the words on the screen. And if you would like to sing it, please sing along with us. If not, just sit back and picture the entrance of Jesus into the city.
Our second reading this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethpage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, excuse me, if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. And he answered them, I'll tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Again, the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. So you're going to need this. That's why we gave it to you on the way in. So it's here. We've arrived, or at least Jesus has arrived in Jerusalem. So let's join the crowds as we wave our palm branches and welcome the king. So shout with me. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Okay, louder. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Can you imagine the excitement as Jesus, the one who has done miraculous things, great deeds of power, the one everybody expected to deliver them from the Romans is finally there. The crowds welcome him as they would a king. They throw their cloaks on the road. They wave palm branches, sing hymns of praise, and greet Jesus with joy. The king is here. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Can you hear the angels singing? These are acts of worship, simple and true. Now, have you ever felt the same kind of joy in worship? Maybe you have, but maybe you haven't. As we enter this last week of Lent, we're going to take a deep look at worship. We're going to talk about worship as a spiritual discipline, a practice that brings us closer to God. And if you had to define worship to someone who had no clue, how would you define it? It may be difficult because the word worship can be used as a noun, you know, person, place, or thing, or a verb, an action word. In the dictionary, we find that worship as a noun is reverent honor and homage paid to God, a sacred being or a sacred object, or a service where that happens. As a verb, worship means to give reverence and honor to God, another sacred being or object, or to attend a service of divine worship. Now, the Greek word used for worship in the New Testament, when Jesus uses it anyway, is proskuneo, which oddly means to kiss, like a dog licking a master's hand. That's their words, not mine. It means kneeling or prostration, to pay homage, whether in order to express respect, like we see when people kneel and kiss the Pope's ring, right? Or to make supplication, an act of adoration. 
And it is based on an old English word that means worthy. So to nail all that down, worship is an act of adoration, of reverence, an act that shows that the object of that worship is somehow worthy of our adoration and praise. Now, some of us have a good idea of what worship means to us. We attend worship services and generally just use the word worship to convey that. Hey, you going to worship this week? But is worship just a service? Is worship a list of actions, readings, prayers, scriptures, music, and a sermon? Jesus tells the Samaritan woman in John 4 that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. To be a true spiritual discipline, we find that worship, true worship, is one that draws us nearer to the heart of God. And I believe that each one of us comes here on Sunday hoping for an encounter with God, to feel as though we've been in God's presence. And worship is the way that will happen Yet unless we throw away our preconceived notions of worship, the ones probably ingrained in us since we first walked in the doors of a church, we won't be able to discover that kind of worship that we long to know. So let's begin to learn what it means to worship in spirit and truth so we can draw nearer to the heart of God. Now this scene in Luke gives us an insight into what people believe about worship. The same underlying conditions that often drive Christians today drives the worship of the crowds of disciples that day too. And there is joy in the worship we find in this story, but there is also an incredible danger too. The crowds that day were jubilant. They were filled with unrestrained joy and happiness. They were almost in a frenzy. They had witnessed Christ's power, seen his miracles, heard his teaching, and knew he was different. He was special. They knew the prophecies that a king was coming, a king who would set them free. And they knew that that was Jesus. For most of their lives, they had been expecting a Messiah, and they put all their hope in him. He is the one they were waiting for. Their salvation had come. It was a glorious day for Jesus too. Just imagine it, to be so loved, to have people finally see him as their king, the true Messiah. That was probably a moment that made him smile and made his heart leap with joy. And he wouldn't let the Pharisees reign on his parade and stop that joyful noise. Nope, God will make these stones shout out loud if they stop. It was a good day. And don't we want that feeling when we come to church for worship too? We want to feel the joy, feel the love of God flowing in and through us, reviving our spirits, giving us strength for the week ahead. We love Jesus. Isn't that why we're here in worship? To worship the living Christ who has done such great things for us. He has given his life for us, showed us the way to eternal life, and has been the love of God made real for us. And I hear people say that to me, Pastor, I want to feel that joy. I want to feel the Holy Spirit in the room. I want more than anything to feel God's love for me. And I come to worship praying that that will happen. But sometimes, and if we're honest, probably most of the time, we come, we go, and maybe the message or the music has given us a bit of a lift, reviving our malnourished souls for the week ahead, but we can't really say we felt the presence of God in such a way we feel like dancing down the street. Am I right? So what's going on that we don't feel God's presence, that is there something wrong with our worship? Well, I will say yes and no. And I know you love it when I do that. But it's the truth. Let's turn back to our Palm Sunday story. We know by the end of the week, these same people who were jumping for joy, calling him king, were the very ones who were calling for his death. They had stopped believing in Jesus, stopped thinking he could do anything to save them at all. They stopped worshiping him, and now they wanted him out of their lives for good. 
See, every year we talk about this crowd and how they turned on him so quickly. Worshiping him on Sunday, wanting him dead by Friday. And we don't understand. How could that happen? But yet it happens all the time. And there's a lot of us who don't recognize the danger this crowd reveals to us. We don't really know what did it for Jesus, why the crowd stopped loving him. But one thing I can say with confidence is that their worship of him that Palm Sunday as he rode into Jerusalem was not true worship. Their worship of Jesus was based on their own expectations and requirements, not on who he really was. They expected him to be more powerful than the Romans, be the savior who would lead them to freedom. And when he didn't meet those expectations, didn't do for them what they wanted him to do, they were disillusioned and disappointed and stopped believing he was who he said he was, who they said he was just a few days earlier. Since you didn't do this for us, Jesus, you can't possibly be our savior, our king. And this disillusionment, this disappointment happens to us too when we bring our own expectations to worship. And we do have expectations. We know what we want from Jesus, from our church, from the worship service. And when things don't turn out the way we expect them to, we can become disillusioned and even turn away from our faith. It it can happen when people in our church, pastors included, don't act the way we expect them to. We forget that the church is a gathering of sinners in need of redemption and that we are all here, including me, to, be, to let the Spirit change us from the inside. We all make mistakes, yet we expect our brothers and sisters to be holy and perfect. And when they're not, because none of us are, our expectations become disappointments and then become barriers to the true worship of God. And that disappointment can turn us away from our faith. The same response can happen when we expect God to always be working for our prosperity, to protect us from all things bad. God does work all things for good, but that has never meant that every aspect of our lives will be good. That's called the prosperity gospel. It's not true. When the bank is foreclosing, when the doctor says cancer, or the marriage is over, we can feel our expectations going down the drain along with our faith. See, when we bring our own expectations to worship like the crowds that day, we can go from worshiping God, claiming Jesus as our Savior, to casting him aside and wanting him out of our lives. After all, if he can't save us from the challenges of life, make us feel good, What good is he anyway? We want another king. And the same problem arises here at church because it's easy. You know, we've been trained to come to worship with our own expectations without ever seeing the danger of our own preconceived notions and expectations. What we expect is great music, a good preaching style, and sometimes to be entertained. We want that feeling. We want to worship God and to encounter God as we worship, but that's not what we expect. What usually happens is that instead of being trained to expect an encounter with Jesus, we've been trained to use our expectations to evaluate what is happening in the worship service. So we take notice if someone didn't say the right thing at the right time, if the bulletin has a misprint, and you can check it does, if the organist was having a difficult time with the music, if the pastor had a scratchy or irritating voice, or if the greeters were talking to each other instead of greeting people, and who was wearing what. You know what I mean, right? And I'll confess that most of the time, that's me to a T. I notice everything that goes right and goes wrong. 
And I guess I should, since I'm the pastor, and I believe that this time of worship is the most important hour of the week, and it's my job to provide a meaningful, smoothly run worship service. But the problem comes for me and for you when all we do is evaluate. We can miss that encounter with God because we expect a perfect service instead of an encounter with the living God. See, I often have to tell myself to stop evaluating and just worship. So what about you? Do you come to encounter or to evaluate? My guess is that we've all been caught up in one or the other at any given time. See, when the Samaritan woman talks to Jesus, she talks about the right place to worship. Remember that? You worship here, we worship there. Jesus says that where we worship God is not important. He says that true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth, and God will seek out people who will worship him this way. And I think we can all understand her statement on one level, right? We've worshiped in the sanctuary. We've worshiped in fellowship hall. Is one the right place to worship and not the other? No, it doesn't matter. What matters is that we worship and that we worship together. Where is just a matter of preference, not something God really cares about. I've worshipped in airports and jungles, on beaches and in the buildings. I've worshipped in my van, driving around and dancing in my living room. And I know that's not a picture you want to see. I've worshipped through drawing and journaling. So again, what is worship? Worship is about encountering God through our acts of worship, like prayer and music, our offering, our attending to God's word when it is read and preached about. Worship is about surrendering to God, about giving Jesus our love and devotion, our reverence and adoration. It is about trusting God even when the dark times come and we don't understand what God is doing. When we come to worship, if we can just let go of those expectations and stop worrying about the order of worship and who is doing what when, what kind of music or if there's any music at all or the technology or what the preacher is wearing or all those other things, they become distractions and barriers to our experience of God. Then maybe, just maybe, we can bring what Jesus really wants, our true selves, broken and unworthy, in need of healing and redemption, laying our burdens at the feet of our one true king like cloaks on the road, coming to meet him right here in this place. True worship allows us to receive God's grace, puts us in God's presence whether we feel it or not, and it restores our soul. The big question we will need to ask every day is if we are willing to surrender to God and the Spirit in order to allow true worship, worship that encounters the living God. And if not, then it would be better to go to the theater because it would only be about us, about our needs, how we feel, our need for entertainment. What we do here in this hour is not about us how we feel, our expectations, or most certainly not about our entertainment. Worship is not about what we do. It is about what God does when we bring our whole selves to him and expect an encounter with Jesus. It's not about the music, the sermon. It's not about what we feel or our experience. It's not about or even for us. Worship is about gathering as the people of God in expectant hope that we will be changed by the power of the Spirit as where two or more are gathered in his name, there he will be among us. It is the expectation that as Jesus changes us, the world will be changed by the message of the gospel that lives in us. When we can bring our lives and surrender them to God, leave our expectations of a perfect worship service home. When we come simply because God is God and we are here to adore him, to give him the honor that only Christ is due, then we will be worshiping in spirit and truth. 
We will be those worshipers God seeks. And we may not fall down and fall prostrate on the floor, but in our hearts, when we come, we should bow in the presence of God, surrendering our lives, giving up our expectations and preconceived notions, and just giving praise with grateful hearts for what Jesus has done for us. Worship the Lord with gladness. Draw near to God through the spiritual discipline of true worship. Expect to encounter God in this place, but remember that God really never leaves us or forsakes us. Jesus is always with us in our hearts wherever we go. So truly, we need to let our whole life, not just this hour on Sunday, be lived in worship. So if you will worship with me one more time, grab those palm branches. We're going to shout again. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, louder. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, you came into Jerusalem to shouts of joy. And Lord, we know this week we will remember how those shouts quickly turned to shouts for your death. So Lord, we ask that we surrender to you as our king and let our hearts always revere and adore you for who you are and what you have done for us. And let our shouts always be shouts of praise. Amen. So if you'll please stand and sing our final hymn, I am thine, O Lord. Right? Yeah. Okay. I wasn't even looking at the bulletin and I remember. <laughs>
So this week, really reflect on what worship means to you. What would it look like to live your life in the spiritual discipline of worship? What would that look like for you? Think about that. And then put it into action. Live your life in worship to Christ, the only one worthy of our praise. And then go and share that joy, share that message with others so they too will know what it means to encounter the living Christ. Go in the peace, the grace, the love, and the joy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.